dynamic year for everyone. So um, the Community Foundation is no different. We've done a lot of really unique um, things during this time. And um, I'm really excited to hear about your match program. Josh and I actually were talking about that. So if you have questions on any of the information that Josh gave you, um, that was information that came from my desk as well. So if you want more information on the Forgotten Initiative or uh, where Loving Bottoms is at right now and their needs or any other of the about 80 nonprofits that we serve in Knox and Warren counties, don't hesitate to ask me at the end of this presentation. I'll gladly fill you in on any um, of those needs. So let's get started. I will get a hold of you, Tiffany, for that here soon when we're done today. Sure. Yeah, yeah. no problem. Thank you. So um, a couple things just to remind you about your community foundation, although I think a lot of you um, have worked with us in some way or capacity before, but we do serve Knox and Warren counties. We help to connect community members with the causes that they care about. So those community members that want to be philanthropic or charitable, um, we help them do that. So we also support law, uh, local nonprofits via grants and philanthropic funds, specifically donor advised funds or designated funds. Um, and we also really support local nonprofits and donors to build endowment to keep local wealth here and also for sustainability and programming. We want some of these programs to uh, carry on their legacy forever. So that's really the high points of what we do here at the foundation. Moving forward to some of that work that I said we kind of had to transition to this year. One of those hurdles is working remotely. Uh, the foundation has never undergone that, but fortunately we were able to figure it out. And so currently our office is actually working remotely. I came in today to have a better um, you know, background, if you will, than my living room. And also my dog is loud. She likes to participate in meetings with me. So I didn't want any interruptions, but um, no matter the situation, we have continued to be accessible to people who care about uh, philanthropy in their area, as well as supporting nonprofits through this super, super dynamic time. One of the First things that we initially did with the onset of the pandemic in March was to come together with other local funders, specifically the McLean uh, Family Endowment Fund, the Vitali Family Foundation, um, as well as both the Knox and Warren County United Ways, and we established the Rapid Response Fund. Um, the Rapid Response Fund is a disaster aid uh, designated fund meaning that right now it's specifically used for COVID-19 needs and to support nonprofits that are responding to those emergencies or frontline services. Um, and so we've done a lot of granting for PPE and, um, you know, other, other opportunities that have made organizations able to kind of pivot some of their missions during this time. When we are hopefully on the other side of the COVID-19 pandemic, this uh, fund will remain at the Community Foundation for whatever emergency or disaster related event happens. We are in the Midwest, so we know very well that tornadoes can be devastating to communities um, or, you know, in, in certain areas of our region, flooding is a really um, impactful event that can can change people's course of action or organizations kind of doing business. So this rapid response fund will continue um, even after the pandemic to again um, be there to support after any type of disaster. We um, currently, our, our fund has received a little over $360,000 in contributions, which is amazing that has helped us to put out um, just north of $270,000 in grants here locally in Knox and Warren County. 
Um, also within that, the foundation was very active in collaborating with the Illinois COVID Response Fund um, and the Illinois Alliance of Community Foundations to disperse some of those philanthropic dollars that were coming out of the governor's office um, early on in the pandemic. So they really looked at community foundations and United Ways um, that already had disaster funds set up that were easy to get money into the hands of nonprofits quickly um, so that they could continue serving the people that call this region home. So that was something else that was really fortunate for us and this fund to be able to do. Another opportunity that we had come up um, this year was the opportunity to get some funding for our arts organizations through the Illinois Arts Artists Relief Fund. They again were looking for places like community foundations um, to raise dollars that would match then dollars that Illinois Arts Relief Fund was wanting to put back into our communities. So it was a two for one match grant opportunity with the Art Alliance of Illinois and the Arts for Illinois Relief Fund. Um, we raised $40,000 and the AIRF fund gave us $20,000. So $60,000 with that program was disseminated to local arts agencies um, just a few months ago. And those grantees included the Buchanan Center for the Arts over in Monument, Nova Singers, Galesburg Community Chorus, Prairie Players Civic Theater, and the Orpheum Theater. Another opportunity that we took uh, this time to really focus on was how do we support and prepare our nonprofits for what's happening right now. Um, so we had been talking about launching a professional development series uh, prior to COVID-19 and the pandemic um, that we wanted to launch later this year and into early 2021. Um, because of the pandemic, we kind of switched our timing around on that and launched a 10, um, I'm sorry, a 10 week series, including seven sessions um, that were brought to us by the brilliant minds of the Lilly School of Philanthropy at um, Indiana University, Purdue University Extension. Bill Stanza Cavage, if any of you are familiar with his work, um, provided us with a five series on leadership and collaboration. And then we had two sessions from um, a wonderful group called La Piana Consultant Agency. They are based out of Denver, but they really help nonprofits take a look at their capacity and kind of grade themselves and assess themselves to see where they need to focus their time and energy. Because what we found during this time that was really jarring for a lot of people was and organizations for that matter was that um, everything just stopped, right? So all of their programming, most of their programming wasn't able to be facilitated or their fundraisers or everything that, that tended to make them who they are was no longer. So, you know, clearing through the panic and the fear and, and the newness of all of that and giving these organizations and their leaders the tools to kind of say, okay, excuse me, do we, do we hit pause right now and take this time to look at the organization and see what we can do? Um, so there was a lot of capacity and adaptive capacity work that was done in those sessions. Or is this time really showing us um, that we need to start, you know, collaborating with other organizations or looking at the health of our organization and the sustainability of our organization moving forward because I think this was an upset that nobody anticipated or prepared for. And so um, personally, I think a lot of great things have, have shown itself through this pandemic. And it has come in the form of what can we do to make our nonprofits and our organizations stronger so that when we're faced with whatever the next thing is, um, we're prepared. So we about 26 local organizations participate in that series and around 60 individual people participated in that seven session series, which um, I think was just fantastic. So that moves us on to um, 
one of the other things that we kind of launched right now because everybody was really focusing on the negative and what wasn't happening and what you know couldn't have access to we wanted to show what good was happening and what was going on um, in our community. So we launched an initiative called hashtag so much good happening, where we really wanted to highlight some of the awesome philanthropic work that was going on, you know, during this time and right here in our communities. And so, as you all know, uh, Carrie Hartline, who is um, very involved with the Galesburg on track heart and soul stuff, they have a fund with us at the community foundation that they use to then in turn um, take the guidelines that uh, of the things that we um, love about our community and grant to programs that uphold those values that we've adopted through the heart and soul initiative. One of those programs this year was with the uh, library, Galesburg Public Library, they reached out to me and they said, we have this amazing idea for a story walk. We wanna put it in Standish Park. It's gonna be a great way for uh, children to do something fun with their families, to learn a little bit, you know, have some of that interaction. And so while we didn't have a particular grant program at the Community Foundation that, that addressed that, I immediately thought of uh, our Galesburg on Track Fund and knew that this would be something that would be right in their wheelhouse. So sure enough, I reached out to Carrie Hartline and Tom Simpkins and said, hey, I have this proposal. Um, would you consider funding it? And they reviewed it, their committee met, and sure enough, they said, yes, this is absolutely you know, something we wanna do. So uh, a few months later, the Story Walk is now available in Standish Park. And you can see here this little uh, her name is McKinley, but she's just about the cutest thing standing next to that story walk. So that is definitely something great happening um, in our community. The second was, as you probably know, hear, whatever, um, food insecurity and access to nutritional food was top of the list for when this pandemic happened. And there are a lot of groups making sure that our friends and neighbors and community members are being fed really well. So um, here we have a picture, I believe this is from the Knox Prairie Community Kitchen. They do a free uh, dinner every other Thursday at the Baptist Church downtown that you can just drive through and pick up. And they are just um, a wonderful group of dedicated individuals making sure that uh, people have full stomachs and, and a community surrounding them as well. Here we have the Salvation Army. So I, uh, so much good happening. Salvation Army, one of their missions is not really um, to, uh, you know, attach themselves to food insecurity. What they do, and it's really amazing, is um, they are basically a case management system providing, um, it's called Pathway of Hope. So housing or homelessness prevention um, to members of our community. Something that we've seen this, this year, this past year, is um, we have a lot of vulnerable families or community members that in any other given year, most of the time they make it through each, week, each year just hanging on, right? Um, they're just on this side of, of having um, to utilize human services in our community or whatnot. And what we really saw during this pandemic is those individuals, those families that were holding close to that line got pushed over. Uh, whether it was from loss of wages or furlough or, um, you know, illness that happened with loss of work time and things like that. And so uh, the Salvation Army really started to see an influx in people needing to utilize their services because the brilliancy of what their service does is it's, it is a case management. So you enter the Pathway of Hope program, and not only are you um, breaking the generational poverty cycle, but you're also getting assistance in, you know, how do I keep a, a household budget? How do I do my finances? Um, how do I, you know, get transportation? How do I get contact information? Most people need a driver's license. They don't even have identification or a driver's license. And so Salvation Army um, in our area really does a lot to assist individuals. 
including um, utility and rent assistance as well, even if you're not um, already to that point of not having a home or facing homelessness, they also do some preventative care as well so that your family can remain in your home. Here we have you guys brought up Loving Diapers Bottom Bank, or I'm sorry, Loving Bottoms Diaper Bank uh, early air, and here they are. They work with wraparound agencies to supply uh, diapers and continence products and period supplies for women. And very, you know, again, early on, uh, diapers and these types of supplies, one, they're expensive. And um, two, if you have little kiddos in your house, um, or older family members that you're taking care of, or if you're just a lady in general, these are very important products and needs for you. So um, they jumped on having, you know, their drive-through diaper banks at their agency locations, and um, it was just phenomenal to see the people come out and really um, jump in and provide their hearts and their hands to, to giving to our community members. The last one here, hashtag so much good happening that I absolutely love is we were able to um, take some of our rapid response fund dollars and share with the Carl Sandburg um, College Foundation. They established an emergency fund for their students there because what they were starting to see with the onset of the pandemic and everything that came with that is, um, you know, we had local students who were having to choose between paying their tuition or paying their car payment because they needed their car to get to work or get to class. Um, and, but they weren't gonna go to class if they couldn't pay their tuition. It was incredible. Um, as well as a lot of students that were single parents um, and all of a sudden their daycare was gone. So they needed assistance in you know, finding that or getting technology so that they could be safe at home with their children and also attend class. So a lot of those things um, there that we were able to come together with our local um, funding bodies and foundations and work together to get the emergency funds to those students. So to wrap up, um, we here at the Community Foundation are working uh, just as hard, if not harder, to make sure that our local nonprofits are supported during this time um, because we do know that they are the boots on the ground for people that are needing these services, especially during this time. So um, I'm happy to take any questions that you have or explain anything to you. Um, I love what I do. I am very passionate, so I could probably go on and on and on um, about the work that we do and the generosity that we see every day um, from donors, from nonprofits, from entities like that, that is just truly amazing. So um, in all of my work in nonprofit and community outreach, I will have to say that I have never lived in a community like Galesburg where um, even though we tend to operate a little bit in silos, um, I have never seen such passion for our community by our community members. Um, it, is, it is a truly, truly amazing thing to see us take care of one another. And so, um, you know, you hooked me, Galesburg, you hooked me. And I know that you all are very philanthropic as well. So thank you for the work that you do in keeping our community um, ahead of the rest as well. Questions? <clears throat> um, <laughs> Tiffany, if you can uh, get the presentation off so I can see the rest of the people, if you would. Thank you so much. Yes. What a great, what a great talk. Any questions for uh, uh, Tiffany? Okay, Tom has a question for you, Tiffany. All right. A donor advised fund. Do you send out an annual statement to county showing what your balance was end of the year, uh, interest or dividends earned, disbursements paid, any contribution to that fund? Uh, you send those out, and how often do we do that? Yep, so if you, any, any fund that you hold here at the Community Foundation, whether it's a designated fund, a donor advised fund, 
um, an endowed fund, you do get, uh, we send out quarterly statements and we can either do that physically or when you set up a fund with us, you actually get a login and password that you can actually access your fund and your account um, at any given time. So you can see if people are donating to your fund, you can see what your dividends and returns are. Um, because as you know, we take all of those um, wonderful funds and we invest those dollars in the larger GCF pool that uh, produces um, a return on your fund. So yes, you can access your fund at any time, but we send out statements quarterly. Thank you. Yes, Harold. Yeah. <clears throat> Tiffany, on a uh, donor advised or whatever you call it, endowment, uh, what sort of uh, annual performance do you get uh, to, and how do you keep the the integrity of the principal and are you able to add to it at any time? Sure. So whether or not you're doing an endowed fund, meaning that um, you can always add to the corpus of that fund, um, you, we, we don't take away from it, right? We can't spend that down to zero if it's endowed. It just, that corpus stays intact and annually earns about four and a half percent return on the amount that you have in that corpus. If it is a non-endowed account, meaning that you can take that, that original amount, that corpus amount, and spend it down to zero, depending on what you wanna do with it, um, you're still gonna earn a four and a half percent-ish return on that annually that'll go into your spendable. Does the four and a half percent include uh, uh, servicing, service charges of the foundation? So annually, the foundation takes a 1% um, fee service charge for administering and managing your account. Okay, so that, that brings it down to 3.5% distributed then, or what? Well, Harold, you know, I'm just hitting my talking points, but okay. I think probably a more in-depth question for Sean, our Director of Finance, and Josh. Um, I know about as much to be knowledgeable, but when you want to you want to get into that info, I would say time to move you on to somebody that knows way more than I do. <laughs> Thank you. Any more questions for Tiffany? So really quick, Will, I'd love to take the opportunity. You, you had mentioned some questions about the Forgotten Initiative and the work that they do here in Knox County. And um, I've been talking with them a lot lately. Madison Flack is their executive director. She's lovely. But um, the Forgotten Initiative exists to uh, support three local agencies within our, our county. So DCFS, uh, child Protective Services and Luth, or I'm sorry, um, not Child Protective Services, Child um, and Family Services and Lutheran Social Services. And what they do is they specifically um, exist to support the families that are taking on foster children. So currently we have 141 foster children in Knox County alone. And when people decide to take on um, those kiddos, a lot of times they are coming into foster care with no clothes, no shoes. They don't have, you know, if they do have some things that they're bringing with them, they're in a trash bag. So it's very traumatic and demoralizing for the child. Um, and so these families uh, that take in foster kids, the Forgotten Initiative work really hard to provide them with uh, journey bags for the kid, kiddos. So they're actual backpacks that they can keep their stuff in and they have games and food and things like that in there. They provide clothing and mattresses and dressers and um, a lot of other things to these families for the kiddos that are coming to them from the foster care system. So uh, they also provide a lot of emotional and, and social support for the foster families themselves because as, as you can imagine, that is a very um, consuming and, and emotionally tasking um, thing to take on a foster child because most of them do have significant trauma that they've been through or they have some 
social emotional uh, distress that they are bringing into their foster home. And so they also provide some respite and, um, you know, counseling services to their foster family as well. So great, great organization. So don't, the, the way to get to, to get a hold of you, uh, Tiffany, is to call you at, the, or you have a, a number, like a cell number I can call you on. Sure. So again, we are working remotely mostly, but you can call our office at 344-8898 and you'll be able to choose uh, my, my line and leave me a voicemail and I will get a message instantaneously and I can call you back. Otherwise, you feel free to call my cell phone at any time and that number is 815-997-3200. You can also always reach me via email at tspringer at yourgcf.org. Wow, what a way to get a girl's number. Just, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't need to know anymore to find you now. <laughs> That's right. I mean, don't take it out of context, but I'm pretty easy, Will. <laughs> okay, I get it. Uh, well, you've done an amazing job. Anybody else has any uh, questions for Tiffany? Um, and the, uh, th I mean, that was so informative, um, uh, which brings a lot of questions in the, in the future. Uh, so you guys host, so if Will Ezer wants to start a, a, a foundation, you, you would host that, or how does that work? So uh, one, I would tell you that is definitely where you're going to reach out to Josh Gibb. But yes, if Will Azer wanted to start the Will Azer Family Endowment Fund uh, to be philanthropic, we can definitely help you with that, Will. I'm not saying I'm starting one. I was just asking. I, I don't know. I, I heard. <laughs> I heard some some interest there, Will. Here you go. Here's Mike Lenson has a question for you. Okay. Can you put out the information about how to reach the, the group that takes care of foster kids? I've never even heard of them before. How would you contact them? Sure. So I have contact information from them that I'd gladly share. Also, they have a Facebook page, uh, the Forgotten Initiative, Galesburg, Illinois. So you can check them out on Facebook or if you Google them. Uh, the Forgotten Initiative, Galesburg, Illinois, because it is a um, larger umbrella that they operate underneath. So we're really lucky to have a, um, a branch of the Forgotten Initiative here in Knox County. You should be able to find them online, but I'm happy to share contact information anytime. Does that mean we can get Madison's number too? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, Sarah? Hey. Uh, I'm sure she'd be willing to talk to you, Will, because you're talking about funds and yep. pants and gifts. She definitely wants to well, talk. Well, it's, it's, it's been an amazing uh, support to the project uh, of trying to give, give funds to the community and to the, to the uh, 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 organizations that need that money. And you guys have become very helpful uh, to know where we direct that, you know, that, that, uh, those funds. So... Really appreciated that so much. Thank you. And, and thank you so much. Appreciate it. One more thing, and I think you guys may have brought it up. Um, uh, you guys remember Amber, the the server that that would be. Do you remember Amber, the server that was uh, uh, at the Kensington? If you remember, we usually come up with a. Uh, um, you know, every uh, maybe three times a year, especially around Christmas, for less, like a bucket and, and uh, 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 just give her some tip and, and, and of so. And I'm sure she would probably, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, use that. Um, I sound in the last couple of weeks, I'm just to see you, so I ask you for money. I thought that, you know, our club has money in their account as far as our club. So I might, you know, ask the board and ask you, maybe we'll just pledge three, four hundred dollars and write her a check. What do you guys think about that? I mean, she's been forgotten the whole time because of the circumstances. And uh, and I have to tell you, this was not my idea. My plan some came to me that somebody else came to him from from the Lions Club and they were going to try to do the same thing 
to get some funds for her for, for Christmas. Just wanted to share that with you and, and see if it's you know, generally okay. Uh, and I also wanted to make sure to, to, to thank uh, 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 Trent Cox and Shirley Chu, Mike Lamson, uh, last uh, two weeks ago helped deliver the food for the VNA. Uh, that again, we're giving the Lions Club a hand for that. We do it every other week. And I will, you know, uh, uh, wanna also will thank uh, Jeannie, Jeannie uh, Lamson and Mike Lamson are gonna do this tomorrow. And I will do mine, uh, Julie Lytle, my assistant of uh, 22 years. She's gonna go with me and do that uh, route uh, tomorrow. So please, if there are any volunteers, that want to help us do this, it's every other week until I need two teams of two. Uh, and uh, they're very simple, very easy routes, and uh, uh, it'll put a smile on your face when you feel like you've done that for someone. Uh, just a, a thought that, that if anybody needs to, wants to volunteer and help us out, uh, uh, would love to have you. So, what, what was that for, Will? Sorry. The uh, uh, the VNA is uh, uh, they have a program where they deliver so many. Me I mean, I think every team delivers about forty different meals. And to, oh, uh, okay, sure. Yeah, I know people do who do that. Okay. Okay, and that's a VNA program that that Lions was was helping them. They were helping him specifically the whole time <laughs> until this you know this stuff happened where people had to stay home and with their kids e-learning and all that stuff, they couldn't have the manpower. So they came to us and asked me or asked us as a group. And I thought that was a great idea to participate uh, um, with them. So we're doing it every other week. I think they have four routes. So, and every route gets food every other week. So we take the same route every other Friday, the same two routes. So we get used to them. It took us about three hours and 15 minutes. The first time I did it right now, we have almost right at two hours or a little under. So once you get you know your route, it's, uh, uh, it's easy to do. So again, you know, uh, if, if anybody is interested in volunteering, I'm not gonna make you do, I mean, you can tell me I'm available that Friday and that Friday, and that's what we accommodate. So otherwise I've been doing it, uh, uh, Shirley has, Mike, Roger Haggerty and uh, um, um, it's, it's been several people that have been helping us do it. <clears throat> any, any questions? Okay, with that, uh, again, Tiffany, thank you so much uh, 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 for your time. We appreciate it. I'll definitely be in touch. I might write you a letter, I don't know. But you, you told me everything about you except where you live. No, I'm kidding. No. That's uh, probably pretty easy to figure out too, Will. We don't okay. live in a big city. Okay. <laughs> and I want to wish uh, everyone happy Thanksgiving and, and safe holiday. Um, and we'll see you. Uh, Tom, unless you have something to say. Sure, I have some. I always have something to say, especially after you, Mr. President. Uh, we are having, we're, we are going to miss next Thursday, of course, but December 3rd, we're going to have a very good uh, presentation. It's going to be on growing Christmas trees and the Christmas tree industry. That's on December 3rd. And on December 10th, we're going to have um, an update on legislature with Dan Swanson, our district representative. So that's the 3rd, the 10th of December. We then also have a meeting on the 17th, and then the next two weeks after that will be Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. We won't be meeting, so three times in December, but don't come tomorrow, no come next week, and thank you. I'm afraid that you're gonna be the one coming next week, but uh, <laughs> happy holidays, everyone, and, and uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you again, uh, Tiffany, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. All right, I send you uh, her number.